We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Good afternoon, I'm Asher Rossinger from Penn State University, and today I'm going to discuss one of humanity's most pressing problems, that is, anthropogenic global water insecurity. Throughout human evolution, water needs have played an important selective pressure affecting survival. We've developed several genetic adaptations to water scarcity, including changes to our body proportions to more efficiently use water. Yet these biological adaptations are costly and the last resort. Humans first use behavioral adaptations to meet their immediate water needs, which have increased our ability to survive in extreme environments. Yet globally, 2.1 billion people lack access to safely managed drinking water within 30 minutes of their house. Water insecurity can manifest in three primary ways. First, water scarcity or living in places without enough water and lack infrastructure to deliver that water. Second, living in places with too much dirty water, where reliance on surface water is common. And finally, places dealing with water contamination or aging and failing infrastructure. Water insecurity is defined as the inability to access and benefit from sufficient, reliable, and acceptable water for well-being and a healthy life. The majority of research has assessed how water insecurity is associated with psychosocial stress and mental well-being discussed as suffering for water and suffering from water, while newer research indicates that it's also associated with physical health. We care about water insecurity because this has critical implications for health and human biology throughout the life course and how these problems can compound over one's life. During infancy, water insecurity can increase risk of dehydration, diarrhea, and stunting, in childhood, there's evidence it affects dehydration, altered gut microbiome, and cognitive performance. During pregnancy and lactation, water restriction may lead to higher stress and affect fetal homeostatic thirst set points, as well as lead to smaller fetal body size, which may point to intergenerational effects of water insecurity. And in adulthood and late adulthood, proxies of water insecurity are associated with kidney function, blood pressure, and food insecurity, which are some of the leading causes of morbidity and mortality worldwide. How individuals and households cope with water insecurity is critical to understand. Water is one of humanity's greatest limiting factors. Therefore, humans in water insecure environments must use behavioral adaptations to meet their water needs. For example, in water scarce environments, people often rely on multiple water sources and may spend hours fetching water. Yet the very interventions, often from external actors, aimed at addressing water insecurity may have unintentional consequences. Today, I'm gonna to focus on three case studies of these different types of water problems and how human or anthropogenic changes can unintentionally further disrupt water insecurity and health. First, I wanna to turn to Northern Kenya to discuss an emerging water insecurity issue around the globe, which is increasing salinity content of groundwater. The Dasanich are a pastoralist population that live near the banks of the saline Lake Turkana 
and are highly marginalized. One of the biggest concerns for Dasanich that they expressed to me was that the salinity of their water was increasing and that the water salinity can make them and their livestock sick. In fact, one of their wells in a dry riverbed is named El Chuchumbi, which literally means the salty riverbed. So they have a history of knowing it's salty. And we found that 93% of households are water insecure and that water salinity is associated with that. Development projects in the area have worked to increase water access for Dasanich, particularly in the main town, through the construction of deep wells, standpipes, and pumps. But often, these tap into deeper groundwater, which are more saline or they're built in vulnerable regions like dry riverbeds. And during the rainy season, they can flood and break within a matter of months. We've been tracking the water salinity in this region along with blood pressure and kidney function of Dasanich to understand how the salinity of water sources are changing and are associated with their blood pressure and kidney function. The guidelines for dietary salt intake have been established by the World Health Organization suggesting that humans shouldn't consume more than five grams per day. But there are no similar guidelines released for safe salinity levels in drinking water, except that sodium levels above 200 milligrams per liter are unacceptable to taste, while water with greater than 500 milligrams per liter is no longer considered fresh water. Our water quality results indicate that nearly all of the water sources for Dasanich are above 200 milligrams per liter at which you can taste the salinity. And we found that the hand dug wells range from 200 to 500 milligrams per liter. However, the standpipes in the region had levels as high as 2000 milligrams per liter, which people reported drinking if there were no other options present. They also told us that they use this water for cooking so they're ingesting it in that way. When we examined how water salinity is associated with high blood pressure or hypertension, we found that each additional 100 milligrams per liter of salt concentration in their drinking water was associated with 45% higher odds of hypertension. We also found that the overall probability of hypertension was quite high in this population when you take into account their low BMIs and active lifestyles. Similarly, we examined the odds of hyperdilute urine, which is an indicator of kidney dysfunction. We found that each 100 milligrams per liter of salt in water was associated with 33% higher odds of dilute urine, which was significant in most models, but we need additional biomarkers to confirm this finding. The key takeaways from this first case study are that it's critical to take stock of water quality and the local hydrology prior to interventions as the easier water to access in this region, like the tap water, was highly saline. What happens when you increase access to saline water is that it can have unintended consequences by increasing blood pressure and having implications for kidney function. Shifting to a second case study of a situation of too much dirty water, I want to now focus on lowland Bolivia and the Chimani a group of about 17,000 forager horticulturalists who I've been working with since 2009 and who traditionally have used surface water sources to meet their water needs. The Amazon is a water-rich environment, but frequent flooding, intermittent droughts, fires, and mining all jeopardize water security and can reduce trust in water sources. Development and engineering projects have worked to reduce reliance on surface waters. Yet 30 to 60% of these new water sources are inoperable at a given time, causing frustration and continued reliance on surface waters leading to water insecurity. The Joint Monitoring Program's Drinking Water Services Ladder classifies water sources along a gradient to indicate their relative safety and access. At the bottom is surface water or water directly from rivers, ponds, and streams and all the pictures I'm showing are from Chimani water sources. Next on the drinking water ladder is unimproved water sources, which is water from unprotected wells or springs. And next we have what we classify improved water sources, which have the potential to deliver safe water like taps and protected wells. And the further classification then depends on their distance from a person's home and their availability. 
I wanted to understand what happens to chronic stress when new water sources are introduced. So we tested how differences in water source access, as defined by the drinking water ladder, relate to an objective biomarker of chronic stress. We hypothesized that chronic stress would decrease as you moved up the drinking water ladder. We classified households' access to water sources and we collected hair samples, which we analyzed for hair cortisol concentration as a biomarker of chronic stress. In contrast with our hypothesis of an inverse relationship, the drinking water services ladder showed a distinct pattern with hair cortisol concentration. Compared to surface water, men using unimproved services had 55% higher hair cortisol concentration, while improved water services were not different from surface water. And women showed the exact same distinct pattern where women using unimproved services had 46% higher hair cortisol concentration. So why are unimproved sources associated with higher stress than surface water, which is ranked as a lower and less clean water source on the drinking water ladder? Well, unimproved sources for Chimani, like open wells, often lead to frustration because they can get contaminated and need cleaning. Here, a man is shown inside a well, getting black gunk out of the well, and he told me that this process of cleaning the well took three full days. Yet community members have been told repeatedly by NGOs that wells are a cleaner source of water than river water. And this may generate confusion that could exacerbate stress. Women often complain that kids in the villages would throw trash and batteries into the open wells and that debris would fall into them. Others said that when they would reach a well, they'd be unable to extract water because the water drying bucket was missing, further leading to stress. So the key takeaways from the second case study is that half measures to address water insecurity can have unintended consequences, like increasing frustration and stress, and second, the equity is critical in development projects and provision of clean water. Households living farther away from the construction of improved water sources may experience increased stress and perceptions of disadvantage, especially if they no longer believe the river is clean. Finally, turning to the last case study in the United States, the issue of whether people can trust their water is increasingly important where access to water that meets water quality standards often falls along race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic boundaries. High visibility events like boil water advisories and shocks like national attention to the Flint, Michigan water crisis may create long lasting distrust of tap water. So I've been examining how did the Flint water crisis affect tap water avoidance in the US and what are the unintended consequences of this event? When we examine nationally representative trends in tap water avoidance among U.S. children and adults from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data, we see two things. First, we see huge disparities in who avoids tap water, with Hispanic and Black children and adults not drinking tap water more than white individuals over time, often because of structural inequalities, systemic racism, and growing distrust. And second, after the Flint water crisis in 2013-14, there was a large uptick in tap water avoidance following this event. Overall, this translates into 20% or 61 million people in the US who don't drink their tap water. Why this matters is that when people don't trust their water, they're more likely to avoid it. And concurrently, we see large shifts to exclusive reliance on bottled water in the US since the Flint water crisis. This has substantial environmental costs through single-use plastics, as well as being orders of magnitude more expensive, leading to higher socioeconomic stress. Further, we found that those who don't drink plain water consume twice as many calories from sugary drinks as water drinkers. This is bad because sugary drink consumption is associated with weight gain, diabetes, obesity, and dental cavities. Taking all three of these case studies into account, it's important to remember that as we modify our environment, we change our water supplies, and this results in changes to our exposures. When individuals respond to water insecurity, it's critical to be mindful to provide solutions that understand local hydrology, cultural customs, and address distrust. 
Otherwise, the very solutions we're trying to implement may have unintentional consequences, like shifting consumption toward less healthy options, more saline water, or even sugary beverages. All of these factors can make water problems worse in the long term. I'd like to thank my collaborators and co-authors on the studies I discussed, the funding agencies, the participants, and the great research teams, and the organizers. Thank you.